Hey everybody, Michael Davis here and welcome back to Bone to Pick. We haven't uh, seen you since March and we are thrilled to be here today uh, with the great Marshall Jilks. Uh, I hope everybody out there is staying safe and healthy. We are uh, we're going to be socially distancing today and uh, having a nice amount of space between Marshall and ourselves. Hope every, everybody is using their masks and, uh, and just uh, doing all the right stuff that we need to do. Uh, before we jump in with Marshall, I wanted to uh, give you a little bit of an update on what's going on here at Hipbone Music. Uh, we're super psyched. Next month, we're releasing Brass Nation 20th Anniversary Special Edition, which will feature two brand new compositions for large brass ensemble, which we re recorded remotely over the last couple of months. In addition, the original 10 tracks from uh, the, the original Brass Nation, which features the uh, Chicago Symphony Brass Section, the principal brass of New York Philharmonic, Jerry Hayes, great section from Los Angeles, and all the New York guys. Um, all those tracks have been remastered by the great Phil Magnotti. So uh, we're, we're really excited to, uh, to be bringing that to you. And our video maestro, Kent Smith, is uh, putting together some really fun videos to go along with that. So we'll keep you posted about that. Uh, coming in January, um, I wrote a duet accompaniment parts for the Bone Kill Etudes. So there'll be Bone Kill and Trumpet Kill duets. Uh, and in addition to the book, you'll get uh, play along tracks. So you'll be able to play the first part, second part, and you can mix and match with trumpet and trombone. So uh, give you a lot of options. And then uh, coming in February and March, uh, I've written a, a video series. It'll be a three part series called The Mental Approach to Brass Playing. And that'll be coming out on our Hip Bone U uh, imprint. And um, just kind of talking about all kinds of things that I've experienced over my career, so some of the, uh, the uh, tough times and how we deal with it mentally, and then good times as well. So um, that'll be coming as well. Um, super psyched to be, well, just to see him today is, <laughs> is great, but uh, to be here today with the, with the great Marshall Jilks. Uh, we interviewed Marshall the first time, and I should say he's the first person who uh, is our repeat uh, guest on, uh, on the show, and I can't think of anybody better to have. So this is his second interview with us. Just for a little history, we, uh, we interviewed him in July of 2013 uh, alongside another trombone virtuoso, Ryan Keberly. Uh, and so that was actually our 16th interview at the time, and today marks our 85th interview. So... Uh, Marshall, we're thrilled to have you back, and uh, this is, this is going to be awesome. Um, uh, we're going to uh, be focusing a lot on Marshall's new CD, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, but uh, if you want to hear more about his early years, maybe check out that first interview, because we're going we're gonna to kind of focus on what's, what he's been up to for the last decade or so or since we saw him last on the, on the show. Um, also check out his uh, Hip Bone U lesson, Incorporating Pedal Tones. It will absolutely make your socks roll up and down. I've never uh, heard anything like it on any brass instrument, especially a trombone. And uh, we're fortunate that Marshall's going to do a couple more uh, Hip Bone U lessons today, so we'll keep you posted on that uh, and, and when those get released. Um, he has done so many things since uh, 2013. It's, it's a remarkable career that's still very uh, early in its uh, in its stages. Uh, for me, the way I describe him is he is on my personal Mount Rushmore of all time great trombonists. <laughs> uh, and I'm not going to tell you who the other three are. You got to have martinis in, you know, debatable situation there, but he's definitely on it. Uh, he is um, releasing, as I mentioned, his sixth CD as a solo artist. It's tomorrow, right? As yeah. There's a release date. Yeah. Um, and it is a stunning record. I, I pre ordered it, couldn't wait to get it, and can't stop playing it. It's just a, a remarkable, it's a trio record for a bass, drums, and Marshall uh, entitled Waiting to Continue. All I can say is get it. It's, you will not be disappointed. It's one of the best records I've heard in a long time. Uh, he's also a longtime member of the Maria Schneider Jazz Orchestra and is prominently featured on her new CD, I think, that's coming out, uh, or double CD. Oh, that's it came out, out already. Oh, yeah. it came out already, yeah. okay. Uh, he's mm -hmm. recently appointed to uh, lead trombone of the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra, uh, which, of course, has been on hiatus, but uh, they'll be back without question. Um, his CD, Cologne, with the WDR uh, Big Band in Germany, uh, was nominated for two Grammy Awards. Uh, he is a former member of the WDR band. He has performed and recorded with a myriad of jazz artists, and we'll get into that today. He's a graduate of the Juilliard School, uh, currently on faculty at the Manhattan School of Music. 
without further ado, Marshall, thanks so much. So great to see you. And thanks for coming uh, down to New City to our Hip Bone Music headquarters today <laughs> and uh, to getting a chance to, to, to talk about what's going on in your life. Yeah, well, thanks for having me, man. It's great to be back. For, right. First off, how's the family doing? How are the kids? How are you and your wife holding up through all this? And what's been going on for you? Uh, yeah, everybody's good. Ethan's out in the car and watching Paw Patrol. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. Um, no, it's uh, it's been an adventure for sure since the since this all started. But, um, you know, as, as, as horrible as this has all been in so many ways, it's, for me, I mean, the positive side is I've been able to spend a lot more time with my kids and um, with my family than ever before. So, and um, originally this was, you know, um, originally going to be the, maybe the busiest time in my career in terms of traveling. So um, uh, I was actually a little bit nervous about that. And even one of the tunes on, on the, on the, on the records called Longing for Home. Right. Uh, uh, was kind of, you know, you know, uh, I guess uh, foreshadowing <laughs> uh, that, what that feeling was going to be, you know? Yeah. Um, so, uh, no, everybody's doing well. You know, we, uh, we, um, we were here for the beginning of the, up until about July. And then actually we went home uh, to, to my, my wife is from Hungary. And uh, we went back to Budapest actually for almost two months mm. uh, this summer. And, um, spend some time with her family and, um, yeah, n now the kids are, you know, <laughs> which is kind of, I guess, have in our new, new routines now. And, uh, yeah, it's just, it's, it's definitely a different experience. Um, but, but, uh, I'm, you know, I'm actually enjoying all this time right now and trying to, um, just make, I guess, take advantage of the opportunity to spend all this time with them now. Yeah, yeah absolutely. My wife and I were saying that the other night, like, in a way, you know, you have to be grateful for we, we quarantine here with her son and my two boys for nine weeks and then some more time up in Cape Cod. And, you know, that's not going to happen <laughs> again, probably. I hope it doesn't in that capacity. <laughs> but but in a way, it was it was awesome, you know, just to spend uh, that kind of time. I know your kids are much younger, so it's even more so for you. For you that's awesome. Yeah. Well, what I want to talk a lot about is waiting to continue. Um, as I mentioned, uh, it's a trio record. Your rhythm section is stellar. Uh, let me just start. I have a bunch of questions regarding the CD, but um, uh, let me just start by asking you what, what made you decide to do a trio record? Obviously, that puts a lot of pressure on you in terms of performance, which you rose way past anything I've ever heard in, in trombone land for a trio. But uh, um, the fact that that puts, you know, so much emphasis on your playing, you know, you're, you're basically carrying the record and, and without chordal accompaniment, it's it's stunning in the the compositions we'll talk about in a minute, but those are also uh, really just incredible. So what made you decide to do the a trio record? Well, I, I think it's, uh, it's a project I've always wanted to do, and it's in some ways maybe my favorite format to play in. Um, but, I, you know, going back a lot of years, I mean, I, I, the very first time I ever played at the International Trombone Festival um, was in was in Utah, maybe 2009 or something like that. And I, and I took a trio. Mm. <laughs> I actually brought guys, you know, brought uh, um, drum, uh, a, bass, a bass player and a drummer from New York, and, and we played out there. And um, uh, that's, you know, it's just always been something on my mind that I wanted to record. Um, I, I used to, you know, do a handful of gigs around New York City um, with a trio. And then with this particular trio with Clarence Penn and Yasushi Nakamura, um, we had done some touring the year before. We went out and played in Denver, out in California, um, master class kind of performance in University of Colorado. And um, um, I just, you know, kind of knew, you know, I, I knew I had to record this project. I always wanted to do it. And, and, and in some ways, you know, I don't know if it was the smartest business move because, you know, I think probably your average person in the jazz world says trombone trio and they like, like what is that, <laughs> you know? Um, um, but, you know, I was always a, a big fan of... Uh, like the like Joe Henderson's trio records, the Live at the Vanguard. Sure. Um, it's called the State of the Tenor, double mm -hmm. double CD set, and I just man, you know, just love that the openness of that sound with the tenor sax, and um, obviously there's been a lot of trombone, you know, you know some tr trombone trio records out there as well. Um, but I've always also been a big fan of piano trios. Um, uh, big fan of the Brad Meldau trio, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Chick uh, Corea, Now He Sings, Now He Sobs. Um, I mean, all these kinds of things. Obviously, they have you know the the harmonic thing as well. Um, but um, you know, um, I I think I originally had kind of thought after I recorded my last quintet record, which was called Sound Stories, um, 
I, I, th I think originally then I planned the follow-up record was going to be a trio record, but then mm. I got these two opportunities to record this big band big projects, band stuff, which yeah. Yeah, yeah. I never ever thought I was going to do that in my life. Um, so I couldn't really say no to those opportunities, so I did those records. Um, yeah, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Those are both uh, yeah. tremendous so, um, uh, recordings as well. So we were, um, yeah, we were kind of all set to go into the studio in, um, we were originally supposed to record like mid-April, I think. And, uh, or maybe in the beginning of April, and we had rehearsed a bunch, and we were going to get together one more time. And, uh, and then, you know, I, I'm sure you remember just your date, the, your calendar just started going, tuk, 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 yeah. you know, just like dropping like, you know, silent night. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I still have a Christmas gift. But, yeah. No, um, uh, no, that just got canceled. Wait, oh, just got canceled too. Yes. Yeah, no, um, but, um, um, and so, you know, I was, you know, it's kind of, okay, well, put this on hold for now. And then, Kind of in June, you know, having kind of, you know, gotten, um, uh, well, just kind of gotten used to the new, you know, new situation we're all in. I, I was just in my kitchen one day, and I was like, let me write the bunker studio, see if they're going to open it all. You know? Yeah. And they said, yeah, we're going to open up in a couple of weeks, you know. So I wrote the guys, I mean, you guys, are you guys free? Do you want to do this? Are you okay with it? And uh, and they, you know, they were, yeah, sure, yeah, let's do it. Let's go record. You know, we were, you know, so we were, you know, we we went straight into the studio. And you know we didn't didn't get together again, you know, because you know, just you know. Just, wow, <laughs> the, when was the last time you guys had played together as a trio? Mm, probably late February, something like that. Okay. And I probably hadn't played with other human beings since the beginning of March. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know the feeling. At the first session I had back was just kind of like, <laughs> can I still do this? What are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> Um, what was it like, and, and you were talking about it briefly before we started, what was the protocol like going into the studio? For those of you who don't know, The Bunker is a, one of the premier studios in New York now uh, um, in Brooklyn, and it's just become one of the most in-demand recording spaces uh, in the city. But what was it like going in under those conditions? Yeah, so they, um, they sent us all uh, kind of a protocol that we had to acknowledge and sign. Um, and, uh, you know, they had, you know, you know, the temperature check at the door, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, masks to be worn at all times um, when not recording, you know, um, we're not in your booth. When we were, because it was a trio, we were all separate, you know, so we, everybody had their own room. Um, they said, uh, they had told me uh, no more than one client in the control room for, uh, for no longer than 10 minutes at a time. And so I just said, well, why don't you guys just put some monitors in the main room? And, we, and so we actually had never stepped foot in the control room the entire session. Wow. And we just listened back there. Uh, just because, you know, if you're listening in, in, in the cans all day long, it's just exhausting. Yeah, yeah. So we would just sit there kind of distance, you know, wearing masks and listen back to takes. Um, and, uh, you know, other things, no communal meals. Um, I think no food delivery. So it was, you know, I, I was like making sandwiches the morning of the session, um, made like little grab bags for everybody, you know, like <laughs> jokes catering, <laughs> jokes catering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought a piece of glass. So. No, um, but um, um, yeah, no, it was kind of like that. You know, I like went to BJ's and wholesale club and stocked up on you know a bunch of stuff, and you know everybody had. You know, like a big bag of nuts and <laughs> whatever. Turns out Yasushi's allergic was a bit big disaster. No, um, no, but uh, uh, um, yeah. So the, it was. Um, yeah, those those were the rules. And then oh, I'm trying to think what else. That was basically the gist of it, you know. Um, and in terms of uh, mixing, we did it remotely. So oh, okay. um, Aaron was in the Aaron Navitzi's the engineer there, one of the engineers, and he's the one who did this. But um, he. He was in the the mixing room at the bunker, and then he he sent me like a high definition stream, and so I sat at home listening on my headphones, and we were texting back and forth. Hey, wow. fifteen seconds, can you boost the trombone? You know, um, and it was the text were always. I just did copy paste, boost the trombone, boost the trombone, <laughs> boost the no, <laughs> no. Um, but he. Um, That's always the answer. I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, you know, so we actually did, we mixed the whole record in like one marathon, 10 hour, wow. 10 hour text, <laughs> texting <laughs> session. And it was, you know, so I, I'll say one of the things we did too is, um, you know, obviously the current situation, I didn't want too many bodies in, in there. So I, um, what I did is I bought a couple little tripods, like I already had one for my iPad and, uh, and I bought one extra one that Yasushi used. And I, so I set my, set my iPad up over Clarence kind of up high. And uh, 
and uh, and then I had my phone on a little tripod on me, <laughs> and then um, and then uh, I had an extra camera too that was also on me. You know. um, but um, so what we did is uh, before each take, either Clarence or myself, we would go one, two, three, four, and everybody would clap. <laughs> <laughs> and so on my in my iCloud, my my phone and iPad now I have like I don't know a hundred videos from the session like this and wow, so that awesome. I could just take you know there's the camera works not very fancy there's no zooming or anything but it you know it worked to have some footage from the sessions and be able to put yeah. some videos together and material like that and so um, you know along with catering I'm also doing videography if anybody's <laughs> interested <laughs> you know, so um, so but. Um, so that's, yeah, it was kind of a new, you know, so many things to think about going in. So I re really tried a few days ahead of time to really make sure everything was already kind of set so I could focus on <laughs> playing. Cause, yeah. Because, uh, you know, from a physical st physical standpoint, it's definitely the most demanding format I've ever played in. For sure. Yeah. Right. I mean, but the, the, the mix between, not, not the, fi the, the mix sounds great too, but the, the matching of those, the three of you guys, Yasushi and Clarence and you, I mean, it's just so perfect. I mean, the way you guys play off of each other is really tremendous. Um, in addition to your incredible playing, the, the tunes are just great. I loved every one of them. I oh, mean, thanks. I like the uh, Cherokee and B. Thanks oh. for that. <laughs> <laughs> As if I didn't feel bad enough already. <laughs> Since <laughs> but, <that> too. <laughs> I, <laughs> but I liked, um, uh, especially, well, the uh, Taconic uh, tune is Terrific. Which oh, we're gonna use, if it's okay, we're going to use that at the beginning of this for the uh, intro music. Of course, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and the tunes for you for uh, Cora and uh, Archie. I like when I, oh, remember, <laughs> I remember when you were thinking of naming Ethan Archie. So that was I got a laugh. Actually, out of I that, played but. that a solo at the trombone the ITF we played at in New York. Oh, okay. That's the first time I ever played that. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. I actually kind of wrote it to play that night. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah cool. Um, at any rate, great tunes. Do you have? Um, do you have like a, an approach that you use to composing? Do you have like a method that you go through or is it, you know, sometimes it's melody based, sometimes it's harmonic, sometimes it's rhythmic. How do you, how do you approach writing your tunes? Um, yeah, I, well, I would say ex except for maybe tunes like Archie's theme, Archie's theme, which have some kind of trum, trombonastic kind of things to them. Right. Um, everything else I write at the piano. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, I don't have, Rick, uh, I don't have a real formulaic approach to things like you know I, if I have time I love to just kind of sit down and explore ideas maybe I get an idea um, you know for instance like the tune waiting to continue mm -hmm. that's something that I wrote after after the you know the the lockdown you know kind of that's the uh, first track with the uh, that's the first choir, track think, yeah, yeah, the, yeah yeah the so I, I guess I wrote the tune first and then I wrote those chorales later um, nice um, based off of that but um you know, I kind of wrote the first section, then, you know, the bridge, it probably took me three or four weeks before I found the bridge. Mm. But I kind of like that, just come have, have the time to come back each day and kind of explore. And mm -hmm. um, kind of when I get stuck like that, I have a, an approach of, you know, maybe going from the last chord that I'm sure of, and I know where the melody wants to go. Um, um, so on that one, like the, the A section's finished on an A flat major chord. I know I wanted that. So then I, you know, kind of start searching. Maybe I'll go down chromatically and, and see where does that note fit over the next chromatic note down, uh -huh. you know, and, and different qualities and stuff like that to kind of get me unstuck. But um, I, I like to try to compose kind of by memory when I'm writing tunes and not write too much down. You know, now that said, maybe, maybe I had to get some tunes finished for this session, so maybe I wrote down things just so I wouldn't forget. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Um, and actually, that tune Taconic turns. I came up with the idea driving down the Taconic. <laughs> I saw that in your liner notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, which I mean, you know, I was like, what is, you know, what is this? You know, I just kind of. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's I really great. banged up my fender on that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, um, but uh, um, yeah, I, you know, I don't. I, there's not. Yeah, I just don't have a, a real formulaic way to do it. I, I, I guess this, the formula, the best formula for me is if I have a lot of time that I can kind of keep on coming back to an idea mm -hmm. and, and exploring. Hmm. I mean, I will say sometimes, um, sometimes if, if I'm getting a little tired of writing the same, I, sometimes I write something like this sounds just like my the last tune. So I really, maybe sometimes I'll try to give myself some kind of harmonic challenge or something, you know, like let's try to incorporate more of a sharp five sound or something, something mm -hmm. that's maybe not so characteristic of what I would normally write. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, 
man, it's just an amazing CD. And uh, again, get it. It's like, <laughs> and it, can you get it uh, on your site, right? Uh, yeah, through my, my website or order on Bandcamp. Or it'll basically starting tomorrow be available everywhere. So. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Well, con congratulations and, uh, and good luck with it. I'm sure it's going to get a uh, tremendous response in the trombone community for sure, but, but I think uh, more globally as well. It's, oh, it's going to be awesome. Um, not, to, not to be depressing at all, but I know you, had, <laughs> you were talking about your full schedule that you had, and I know in the, reading the liner notes on uh, Waiting to Continue, you had some really cool stuff that you were involved in that was going to happen. What, what were some of those things that you were involved in that were going to happen before uh, pre-COVID there? Oh, yeah. Um, well, the first thing was uh, uh, a tour with Makoto Ozone, mm -hmm. a great mm -hmm. pianist tour in Japan. Um, actually, we had a couple tours this, that, I was supposed to do, that I was supposed to do with him this year that were both canceled. Mm. Um, but uh, that was canceled. Uh, also, a tour of Japan with the Vanguard Band was canceled. Uh, Maria Schneider had a tour out West Coast we were supposed to do. Can't cancel. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I had a few residencies, different places. Um, and uh, we had a, I was looking forward to doing a tour with the Slide Monsters. We have a, we had recorded a new record, which isn't out yet, but we mm -hmm. were gonna, we had about a two week tour with that group. Um, also canceled. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's, you know, um, yeah. Uh, I'm sure there's some other things I'm missing in there, but. Uh, um, yeah, a couple of residents. I was supposed to, supposed, to, supposed, to, <clears throat> supposed to do something at Temple mm. University and uh, uh, something at, up in Canada in Calgary, kind of like a residency for 10 days. Oh, wow. Uh, that would have been Doing stuff enough. by myself in schools, which was going to be interesting and yeah. <laughs> challenging. Um, yeah. Well, hopefully it's going to... Uh at some point, uh, regroup and, uh, and move forward. And, uh, you know, I know I'm sure like the Vanguard thing, it's, you haven't been a full-time member of the band that long. So I'm sure you're <laughs> yeah. looking forward to the, uh, the opportunity to get on the road a little bit with those, with that incredible ensemble. Sure. For sure yeah, right? yeah. Um, um, speaking of teaching, you are now, I know you were at Berkeley for a few years, but now you're exclusively at Manhattan School of Music. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, that's the only school I'm teaching at right okay. now. Okay. Yeah. How, how are things in this uh, new environment, uh, how are things there? I know that the program has uh, had some changes, and Ingrid's now Ingrid Jens is now running the jazz program. Yeah, is I think that she's correct? the interim director this year. Okay, yeah. so she's running it this year, and she's doing a great job. Um, yeah, um, I mean, I think the school, as far as I can see, has done an excellent job of, of uh, you know, of, of keeping everybody safe, but also uh, being able to reopen with with students, giving them the option to come in person. You know. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I really only teach a few students there, trombone. I just teach trombone lessons. So um, I opted um, to teach, you know, for this semester to, to still teach online there. Um, um, and I th I th the school basically gave the students different track options, you know. So mm -hmm. some students are, or I think it was track A, then they're in New York now, and they're, they're taking some of their classes, you know. And they have all these rules, you know, like... Um, like if, if there's a, a class, you know, um, there can only be so many students in a room and then that they can only be there so long and then the room has, they have to vacate the room for a certain amount of time after mm -hmm. and whatnot. Um, and I think that's, just, that's also true for, um, um, for uh, private lessons in person. Um, but, uh, you know, the students that I, that I have there that are doing uh, um, that are there in person for a lot of their classes, they, you know, they love it so far. Mm -hmm. Um, but then all, some of the other ones are, you know, other students are also, you know, they're, they're, they're still online, only online this semester. And then uh, I think some of them will, some of them actually will come back here mid-semester even. And then some maybe are, are waiting till next semester to come back, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and some students actually did just chose to defer a year, um, which is totally understandable for me. Sure, yeah. Yeah. yeah it's interesting. Um, my youngest son, who you know, Zach, is down at University of Miami and they had a, they had a, the, the, it's called the Super Band this year uh, um, at Frost School. They had their concert two nights ago. Oh, I saw a little bit of that on, yeah. on YouTube. And yeah, and they did a great yeah. job. I mean, yeah. with Maria. They, yeah, with Maria, Maria was yeah. guesting on a couple of things, and Troy Roberts uh, played as well, who I guess is now the new saxophone teacher there. But they just did a phenomenal job. It was all socially distanced. They were split. And whenever you weren't playing, they put the mask on. Mm -hmm. um, when they would come down front to play solo, they had the mask on, play the solo, put it back on. I was really, I was, I mean, I was very impressed by the band, of course, but, um, and the program in general, but 
this they're really on the case and it sounds like Manhattan school music same same thing so yeah I mean I think they do even do some random testing and you know, mm -hmm. people get tested still and I think to come back to school you had to get tested and yeah so yeah and there's you know pretty strict protocols about what you can and can't do yeah, yeah. what do you um, how do you see music education and jazz education going forward and I mean that in the sense that uh, it seems like there's going to be a pretty big shift in education in general um, and I'm worried for, um, you know, just how, how it's going to impact teachers. I know, for instance, I heard recently that Ithaca College is laying off a pretty big percentage. I think I heard 25%. I mean, I don't know if that's completely accurate, so my, my apologies if, if, if it isn't. But it's definitely something that I'm, I would look at the schools are going to have to shift their uh, approach to having, you know, some of it's going to be online. And, you know, obviously for music, it doesn't work so well. But mm. in general education I mean, it just seems like you know it's not going to go back to totally back to normal in my opinion but who knows you know i hope it does but what do you have any thoughts about uh well, where you could see it going i don't ooh, i don't want to get in trouble or no. <laughs> <laughs> um well you know i think in particular with new york schools um I think most people come to schools in New York to be in New York, in particular to study jazz, right? Yeah, so right. So you come, you know, you come to New York to to experience the New York scene, and maybe, you know, as a as a, you know, some people even come here maybe to get a master's as a as a way maybe into that scene or to test the waters or see what it's all about, you know. Right. Um, you know, that said, I I personally don't know how. You know, in terms of the tuitions, you know, I, I don't know how how much higher can they go they keep on going up you know I, a few years ago um i uh there's the uh, university of colorado has something called conference on world affairs okay and uh, brad good runs it you know the trumpet player and, and mm -hmm. he uh, they invite musicians out to be part of this thing and you give a concert uh, but then they also put you on these panels um and uh and like panels, you'll be there with an, like a famous economist or something. So I was on this. They put me on a panel about college tuition and uh, okay. college tuition and college tuition debt. <laughs> um, but I just, you know, I remember thinking back to, uh, you know, uh, I guess whatever, 1996 when I was first thinking about going to school, and I just remember opening, you know, like these, you know brochures and stuff, and it was, you know, you know, I think conservatories back then were about sixteen thousand dollars, right? Um, with room and board, you know. Mm -hmm. and now today, that seems like oh, I have deal, but I'm just like, oh my god, <laughs> you know. Like, so I went to a st my first couple of year, uh, first year of college, I went to a state school out in Colorado, um, University of Northern Colorado. Mm -hmm. um, but that said, so I remember on, on that panel, you know, I, I, I was like looking, okay, well, how at that at that point, it was maybe been twenty years, maybe I was thirty eight years old uh, since I first went to college, and I, you know, I see you know four hundred percent inflation, you know. Yeah, three hundred percent inflation. You know about the, whatever, but it, you know, just astronomical. And so I, I don't, you know, uh, I, I just don't really know. You know, it, this this kind of system doesn't really exist in other parts of the world. I mean, they're private schools, but not not to this this degree of cost. Right. You know, um, so I, I, you know, I, I don't know, but I think something has to change. I don't know how how are people going to, you know, when it gets to a hundred grand a year. I mean, what, what, is there a limit to it in terms? And so that's one thing I don't personally understand when, when a private school, you know, that's that has, you know, um, tuition costs like that. I, I don't fully understand where it's going or why it's increased 400 you know? percent. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at a state school level, I understand, uh, you know, maybe you know, they're getting less and less tax dollars. And, and the, the, I think the provost of the University of Colorado was in the room when I said this. And, and he, you know, he told me, you know, yeah, we're a state school, but we only get 2% of our budget from the state or something like that. So it's essentially really? a private oh, okay. school. Yeah. There. Um, so I don't know. I, I think unless we fundamentally change, you know, change how we allocate money in, our, in this country in terms of education, I, I, I don't know what can happen, you know, because yeah. I don't know, no, you know, nobody's going to be able to afford to go to a conservatory anymore. Yeah. Know? And I mean, obviously it's expensive to run these institutions. Um, but yeah, I, I, uh, <laughs> sorry, I, don't know. I, I don't know. No, that's, that's some good. I think that's some really yeah, good insight, yeah. and I think that's there's going to have to be some some changes to it for sure. You know, it's like especially considering not to digress too much, but to, especially considering the job market for musicians now is 
virtually obviously non-existent, but let's say that it comes back to some capacity. In some capacity, the amount of student debt, even if you're getting scholarships and whatnot, it's, it's, that's a lot of money to dig out from under um, with, with employment opportunities. D- difficult, you know? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's, I don't know, it's, it's a really difficult subject because it's, you know, there's a lot of things that I probably don't understand about it all, but I yeah. you know, just, but just uh, the obvious thing about this, the, the cost, and I just don't know how, you know, um, I don't know how people, especially after this, you know, what everybody's going through right now financially, how are, you know, how can you, you know, so I don't, I don't really know that the right answer to that. Yeah. And I, I don't, you know, um, yeah, I don't, yeah. <laughs> Well, I think yeah. that is a good answer. Well, mm-hmm. on a more positive note, I was listening to Always Forward yesterday, Ooh. which is Marshall's second big band CD. And, uh, of course, you had to uh, drive us all nuts by doing a big band version of Puddle Jumping, which is <laughs> uh, unbelievable. <laughs> In and of itself, it's unbelievable. But then having the big band, it's so cool. What a great chart and uh, and the whole record. But uh, talk a little bit about that. Like, I know you touched on it earlier, but that's the second one. Your first one was nominated for two Grammy Awards, which was uh, which quite a feat um and working with the band that you were a part of uh mm-hmm. for a handful of years there um just talk about those the in particular always forward but maybe the cologne as well yeah um well always forward was um the yeah I, I was given the opportunity to come back and write a new program for the band um and uh it's you know i, I can say it's really fun to write a program for musicians that you know you know so uh, but also writing a program for a concert that it's it's, it's such a unique uh, situation and that doesn't really exist anywhere else in the world, right? You have this full-time big band that works in a studio that's always recording as well. So whenever there's a concert, there's it's for, you know before there's a concert, every, everything's recorded, you know. Um, so um, yeah, I, I kind of just uh, I think a, a few of the charts on the record I had written maybe in the year before I had done a concert with Airman the Note. Um, knowing that I was going to be going back to Germany as well. So I think the first time I played that new, that puddle jumping chart was with the Airman and Note. Mm. Um, and also there's a tune in their Morning Smiles that I had, that I did with the Airman and Note. Um, and then, um, uh, yeah, I just, you know, I, um, I guess, I think three of the charts on the record are trombone features. And there were, I think, two charts as well that there wasn't, that, that didn't make the record just because there wasn't space, you know. Mm. Um, um, because, you know, when, when you go, when I, went over there to get, you have to write enough music for a for you know like a 90 minute concert um so um yeah, there's a couple of things i did you know i I, re- I really love playing standards in different keys and um easy to love is one i used to take mm-hmm. to keys practicing and stuff a lot so i chose to try to sit down and reharmonize it and wrote an alto feature that's on that record but uh um yeah it's you know um it's for me. That's like what, a huge thrill is to, to to write, put all the work. Because I mean, you know, you've like writing a big band chart is it's <laughs> it's a lot of work. Yeah. Um, so when you you know when you're locked you know locked in your room writing all summer, and then you get to stand in front of a band of that caliber and hear everything back, and and it, it's just it's just a huge huge thrill. But it's also it's a, it's a real challenge though because especially when you're also playing on the concert so yeah. if you if you have charts that you're featuring yourself on conducting and playing it's like you're in the middle of a soul and you're like thinking okay what do i have to do next in terms of <laughs> do i have to cue somebody um so it's funny since you know doing that or sometimes i'll go out as a guest um uh, with with big bands and conduct them and play but then there's sometimes i'll go to a, a university and the director wants to conduct the concert which is totally fine and it, it feels so easy after doing all that <laughs> you, know, you, you know when you just sit back and you're like okay i'll have to do is play a solo <laughs> it's <just> like, <laughs> um but uh, yeah, I, you know, I love, yeah, like I, when I was a kid, I never would have imagined that I would have, you know, maybe written a big band chart, and, <laughs> um, not to mention like two, two records worth, you know, um, and it's, uh, you know, I, I hope I can do another one sometime with them. It's a lot of fun, um, you know, to go back there. I lived there for four years and I was yeah. a member of the band, but, uh, but like I said, it's also fun to write for, for you know, people you know, and to be able to go, you know, and, and record a big band record where you have multiple days in the studio and it's, you don't feel, you know, oftentimes we do sessions in New York. It's like, okay, okay, we're going to record this record today <laughs> and we're going to rehearse it today as well, you know, and we're going to mix it today, <laughs> you know, like that's, you know, where it's there. It's like, okay, well, 
We've got another hour today. Maybe we'll, well, let's call it for today and we'll, you know, we'll regroup tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, so I, you know, those, those concerts are, and, and the time in the studio there is like, you know, really, really great memories for me just to, you know, just that experience of, you know, you know, standing before a band and like that. I don't know. It's just a, it's a real thrill. For yeah. Me. Yeah. Yeah, it comes out in the music. It's great. So when you're picking up uh, Waiting to Continue, get Always <laughs> Forward and Cologne at the same time. Uh, it's uh, tremendous. Um, that leads me right into a question I had and just a thought, really, like future of live performance right now. One of the things that concerns me, and, you know, we've done some shows with my band at uh, one of my favorite venues, Subculture, you know, places like that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, any any club, really, but but also performance spaces, um, I'm very worried about all of them, their financial health. And um, what I'm not as worried about is that, that the demand is, is, is still there. I mean, I see, you know, people doing these small concerts. They're sold out, even, you know, even though everything's mm. socially distanced. See, if people want live music, it's always going to be a part of culture and life. And, you know, you mentioned how it is in Germany, obviously much healthier than it is here in terms of support and, mm -hmm. and finances and whatnot. But how are you feeling about, you know, your own groups, the groups you're obviously with two of the premier large ensembles in the in the world, Maria's band and the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra. You know, obviously we all are thinking positively and hoping that everything is okay. But, you know, we're, I'm looking, you know, I had a session in, in, in the city not too long ago and walking through midtown Manhattan is not a pretty sight. I mean, it's, you know, it's going to be tough. So I don't know. I just was not to, to not to be uh a Debbie Downer over here, but uh, but yeah. I was wondering how you how you felt about you know what's encouraging is like I said people want music that's great and uh, how that how we're going to navigate through this will be an interesting time. Wow, <laughs> I was feeling good on the drive down here, Mike. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Um, well, I I don't know. I I'm actually I feel pretty optimistic about things. You know, I mean. Um, I still have quite a few, I, I think I have quite a, quite a, quite a few things booked next year. And, and a lot of the things that were canceled, those, you know, tours and whatnot, the organizations had said, um, we're going to, we're going to do them next year. So, um, um, you know, in terms of venues, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, um, you know, I, I guess similar to what I was saying about education. I mean, I hope, I hope the government chips, you know, comes, you know, helps, you know, yeah. Because this is, you know, these are unprecedented times, you know. Um, but I, I think, you know, no matter what happens, I mean, there's always something, you know. I, you know, if some places do end up closing, you know, I, I, I think, eventually, they'll, you know, something else would open up, you know. I mean, because mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. you said, the demand for live music, you know, I think, I think one, you know, one of the outlets people have had is these live, you know, these streaming concerts and whatnot, which is amazing. It's great. Everybody's had that. At the same time, I personally feel that it's also shown the, the how valuable the live performance is. Because mm -hmm. it's not, you know it's it's not the, for me it's not the same. You know, there's nothing you know. Um, you know, I don't feel like I can get the same chills over the internet that I can in person. You know, mm -hmm. and I'm not trying to you know take anything away from that at all. I think it's incredible, and I've played some live streams, and just that opportunity to be in a room playing with other musicians again that's that's incredible. You know, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. but in terms of audience, um, you know, it's. Uh, you know, I think that that the need for that is never going to go away. Mm -hmm. So, it, 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 you know, it'll find a way yeah. to come back one way or the other. And um, so I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about it. Well, I, we're all glad to hear you say that. That's yeah. exactly, <laughs> I think that's the way you got to look at it. Yeah. And, and, and hopefully, yeah, I agree. Live music is always going to be part of uh, the world. So, yeah. Um, looking back since the last time we had a, the good fortune to interview you uh, seven years ago, uh, what are some of your favorite uh, things that have happened to you? They don't have to be in music either. Life. I know your kids were born in the last seven years, so that's yeah, going to yeah. be a highlight. And and some favorite musical moments. You've already talked talked about a few of them, I'm sure. But mm -hmm. uh, other things that strike you that uh, looking back and give you that positivity. Well, um, I mean, obviously, getting married and having a family has been a, a big <laughs> a big highlight. Um, uh, you know, I, uh, playing and touring with this group, the Slide Monsters, that's a really, uh, really unique thing. And, and those, the, the first tour we did um, in Japan was pretty, uh, 
just a really incredible experience to walk out into concert halls every night with a trombone quartet <laughs> um, and to play with guys of that caliber, you know, Brant Atsuma and Joe Alessi, Joseph Alessi and, and Eijiro Nakagawa. Um, you know, walk out and play incredibly challenging music, but every night, I remember we played, we played in, I think it's Symphony Hall in Kawasaki, and there's like 11 or 1,200 people there to see a <laughs> trombone quartet, you know? Um, That's awesome. That was just a pretty amazing experience. But also because... Um, because that group, I love I love to practice and play classical stuff still, and practice my large bore horn every day, almost every day, and and just you know try to keep that side up. It's just it was a big part of my upbringing, and I still um, I just still love working on it. So to, mm -hmm. to get an opportunity, and I mostly work in jazz jazz settings. So, but to get the opportunity to to go play in a group where I get to do both, you know, um, that's just a really really awesome thing to be a part of. Um, that. Um, yeah, obviously the the two records with WDR were yeah that's that's you know those are big highlights for me. Um, getting to play with the Airmen and Note was a pretty amazing thing, and then also that then the last year I got to play with the Falcon Airs. I don't know mm -hmm. if you're familiar with them. They're part of the sure. um, Air Force Academy band, and that was the band where my father was a conductor. Um, and so the big band there is called the Falcon Airs. And when I was a kid, those were the guys who got me into jazz and to playing. And my first jazz teachers were both from that band, a guy named Mark Burdett and Mark Israel. They're since retired. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, like, you know, that that group and, and those musicians, I, I wouldn't be who I am if it weren't for them. And so uh, I first got to go play with Airman and Note, and it was a really cool concert because um, they, they, <laughs> they tied it in with something... Um, called there's something called month of the military child <laughs> it's like, rolls right off yeah, the tongue which i'm sure there was i'm sure there were a lot of generals and like you know like people going you picked a trombone player to be the month of, no this is not the you know um but it was you know a real special experience for me because um my dad also used to be part of the air force band in washington and uh, he played euphonium and the ceremonial brass there and also the concert band and then uh became a deputy conductor there i think um and then, you know, before we started moving around as a as uh, when I was a kid, and then, um, uh, but then, you know, I got to go back to Colorado Springs last year and play, uh, conduct and play with Airman and Note, and that was just kind of like full circle a little bit, because, you know, growing up with those guys, going up to them, probably annoying them after the concert, hey, <laughs> hey, what, you know, what were you thinking when you were playing over that A minor chord? You know, like, was that Dorian? <laughs> um, Shut up, kid. No, it's good. No, they weren't, no, like, they couldn't have been nicer guys, but, uh, um, yeah, those. I mean, definitely, those were some some highlights. Uh, yeah, I, I'm sure there's. I hope I'm not missing anything big. It's, you know, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, yeah, that's an awesome experience to go know, back to a band like that that you have so much uh, personal connection to. Very cool. Yeah, Very cool. yeah. So um, yeah, th I mean, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm just mumbling right now. No, I'm trying it's to great. think of any it's other good, I mean, any other big great, highlights. Great to uh, hear that. Um, you mentioned as we as we kind of wind down now, um, you have things booked for next year. What's uh, what's uh, what's next year looking like for you? What are what are some of the things you're hoping are going to happen? Uh, yeah, uh, well, right at, right now um, I have a few residencies at schools that are still supposed to happen. Um, our tour with the Slide Monsters from this past year I think is postponed till next September. So I'm hoping hoping that, that happens. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I think uh, hopefully this some of these. I think some of the stuff with Maria was supposed to maybe be uh, rescheduled for next year. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, who, <laughs> who knows? Yeah, who knows? It'll be something yeah. uh, good. Yeah. Marshall, thanks so much for for coming down. I've got a little gift for you as a thank oh. you. Fancy hip bone music socks, oh. which you cannot purchase. There, we only have them as our holiday giveaways. And uh, you are our first oh. uh, holiday giveaway for oh, this thank year. You, so. man. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, everybody go out and get this. Waiting to continue. Amazing record. Uh, much success with it. I know you don't need any luck. It's it. <laughs> yeah, don't try the socks on. Now. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. All kidding aside, Marshall, great to see you. Uh, continued success with everything you're doing, uh, especially with the record. And, and thanks again for taking the time to come down today. Oh, man, my pleasure. Thanks for asking me. And uh, we're super happy to be back. I'm not sure when our next uh, interview will be, but it uh, will be hopefully soon. Look for Brass Nation 20th Anniversary Special Edition coming out next month. Everybody be safe and stay healthy.